Eddie, uh, myself, Eddie Conway, he, he continued some of that conversation around what the steps that need to be done now. I mean, we talked about and learned from the past, but in particular, you identified uh, the objective of building the security networks, uh, taking our time, uh, building, uh, targeting 22 cities where have predominantly black populations, possibly looking at looking at the Jackson plan as what happened in uh, Mississippi as a model. Can you continue that conversation somewhat? <laughs> Well, when I married, Baraka was still alive. He said, 20 Mike. Mike. When I married, Baraka, you know, was still alive. Um, he had information and, uh, that African Americans are close to the majority are, or are the majority in 26 cities across the country, the north and the south. <clears throat> and that our effort should be to move in all ways to consolidate that power base. You know, now it would be different in different cities because of the history and what is happening in the cities. <clears throat> but I think that uh, Detroit is an example um, where <clears throat> the cadre that emerged in Detroit was from Detroit. And that was, you know, I mean, uh, <clears throat> the power, you know, of. Uh, the effort that led by by General, of course, but um, Jen said that on the line he could look down the line and see somebody that he went to elementary school with. You know, and so you know it was that unity, you know, in the factory. You know, I mean, it was a community unity, right? you know, so uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, sometimes we have gotten away from the neighborhood development, you know, uh, like you have folks right in the audience, you know, who have development right in their community that they grew up with. So, I mean, you know, and that's the important thing, you know, so. Yeah, just one the, the last time I was here with General, we were talking about uh, what had been happening in Detroit. Uh, and if you look at the, the broader way that this country has dealt with, with working class power, is that if there's a strategy to consolidate it, then they'll figure out a way to break it up. So if you look at early sociology, they talked about how you have these concentric circles where you have where people live, then you have the factories right there, and then you have the stores, so everything's this lovely kind of coherent thing. Well, when they had the strikes in the 1930s, what that meant was that the factory was next to where you live, so you could sustain the strike because all you gotta do is have your wife or a husband run across the street and give you enough food so you could keep a sit-out strike going for like months. They said, no, no, we ain't doing that no more. So they moved, the, they moved the factories out of the cities, out into isolated suburbs, industrial parts and so forth. So if you're gonna go on strike in a plant, you gotta go like a half an hour drive, commute, right? So you don't, you're not grounded in your neighborhood industrial base that you had in the early years of industrialization. And that was one of the effective ways to break the power of the, of the working class. What happened in Detroit is even more severe because of the success of black people in Detroit. Black people had tremendous economic power in the city because they were the, 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 the gist of the working class, you know. And that sit-down strike that, that Jen pulled, the league pulled in 67, at that turnover at the end of that season, you know, that almost bankrupted Chrysler, you know, they shut down just when you had the turnover from the 67, 68 models. So they couldn't gear up for the next year, and that's just when they had the wildcat strike. That damn near bankrupt crisis. So they ain't happened to that no more. They just picked up the whole auto industry and moved it. 
you know, there's no more auto industry in Detroit, and you can bet you're not going to set up none in the middle of no area where there's a whole lot of black people that can consolidate that kind of power again. Well, let me just interject in, in just a little bit. We have been, technology has impacted us since day one. Yeah. All right. And <clears throat> with the industry moving, is due to technology. I mean, you know, like, why do cities form on shorelines, yeah. you know, around lakes, and, you know, why do they build that uh, yeah. large? Yeah, well, the seaway. Seaway. Yeah. Way. yeah. All right, so, <clears throat> first of us, ships, you know what I mean, like, you know, the slave trade, and your industry evolved out of it. You know, I mean, all over the world, you know, I mean, England, everywhere, you know, and, and the capitalism and, and, and slavery talks about that. And <clears throat> So you had the technology of ships, they, they managed, you know, uh, navigation. Mm -hmm. And then you get into uh, steam. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And railroads. Before that, the technology is two technologies that evolve almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. One in England and one in the United States. And that was the cotton gin to pick the, the short staple. Yeah. And so, you know, cotton be, become, becomes an industry, but it's the spinning gin in England. Because before, you know, like you, you see pictures in India, you know, it would take you know, a while to develop, you know, cloth. But with the spinning gin, <coughs> someone could operate a machine and you got all these spindles and you got cloth. Cotton gin, you know, you got, you know, I mean, millions of, you know, cotton to feed, all right? So what does that do? Because people thought, economically that slavery may, you know, uh, disappear, you know, or road, because it was getting less profitable with the development of the cotton gin, here comes the impact. You need that labor, all right? And so we're victims, you know, again. So, you know, now, <clears throat> what happened, there's an organization, how many people have heard of NAM? Yeah. NAM. Yeah, you've heard of NAM, right? What is NAM? What is it? Oh, no, that's, I'm thinking of it. NAM. National Action. National Action. No, no. NAM. N-A-M. That's right. No. National Association of Manufacturing. That's right. They're the ones that did the study on us, Charles. They're the ones that focused on RAM. Was NAM. The National uh, Association of Manufacturers, right? Right. That, all the studies on the urban rebellions and, you know, like Detroit and everything was the National Association of Manufacturing. So, you know, what they uh, studied was that they had everything in the state of Michigan in terms of the auto industry. Now that wasn't all black, but the, the base was Detroit, and that could spread. And then if, if, if white workers called on, they, you could shut the whole country. Now, 
Again, here's how we are victims of technology. We look at the space industry. They got the space industry. Why they don't? <clears throat> One, they develop computers. Two, they develop alloys. They develop alloys that are lighter than steel that could receive impact against meters or stones, any rock that would hit, you know, the, the space bird. This was declassified to your manufacturers. Now, if you notice, you get a car before 1970, you know, I mean, like a 1950, you know, something car. You try to punch it, <laughs> and you're going to break your hand. But after 1970, you could dent that car. Right? So, <clears throat> they found out that using new alloys, that they could use the interstate highway system to transport chassis and bodies and assemble them at interstate uh, sections cheaper. All right. Then bringing them over to railroads and bringing them through ships and everything else. And so, you know, they all tell us another thing. You know, you learn this yeah, 30, 40 years. You know, so, and so this, the threat and the new technology, which they can get profit from. All right. So, you know, I mean, they don't do nothing. You know, everything happens to us got to, got to, you know, be money. <laughs> you know, got to, they have to make more profit. All right. So this is why, you know, the industries were moved out of <coughs> the uh, <coughs> central cities. First they moved south. Then you have NAFTA where they could ship uh, this, they could have parts made in Mexico and other places and, and assembled outside of the country and shipped back in the country cheaper than what they made in the country. All right, so you have this kind of technology going on from 70 on. Yeah. Okay. Well, but the, the, the key is the, is the consciousness of the workers. I mean, I mean you know, you, go, you know, this is a working class and there's the people that, you know, the bourgeoisie. And if you, if you do that technology in an area where you have a class conscious working class, which is to say black workers in Detroit, who know what they're doing, and you have a theoretician of that process and James Bob sitting here describing that process, before anybody else. There's no white, you know, you know, scholars talking about technology the way James Bond is talking about it and how it's tied to labor. So he's way ahead of everybody else. Right, sitting right here in Detroit. You have a theoretical advance that people don't connect up. And you've got a, a, a organized mass of black workers with tremendous class consciousness who have enough sense to know how to shut the whole thing down. So, because you can technically, with the technology, you can do that in a lot of different places. So, you know, if you go down to Mississippi, Nissan is in Mississippi now, right? And, you know, I went down there for the Freedom Summer Anniversary thing, and they had a group called the uh, Nissan Gospel Singers. And so I asked, I asked the people, I said, uh, do, does, does Nissan, you know, how do you get the name? They said, well, we work at the Nissan factory, and the, and the, the factory supervisor came to them and volunteered to provide them with uniforms and a van for free. 
But the thing said, you know, it says Nissan on a beautiful road, you know, kente cloth and everything, and a big free van that says Nissan, and you point out, you say, my brother, aren't you having some labor problems with Nissan? They said, oh, no, 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 Nissan is good to us. Right, right? where have we heard that before, right? So it, it, the, the key to the chart is, is there are workers everywhere who get exploited, but the question is in this particular place, because of the consciousness, they were aware of that and they were confronting that exploitation at a level that was nowhere else in the country, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, you take it from one set of workers right to work states where white workers don't want a union. They sit down there, they're proud they don't have no union and they get dirt wages and they think at least they're free or whatever, right? That's different from black workers in Detroit that said, no, no, this is the plantation, you know, this is a cotton field in a building. Right? It's that consciousness that the working class is terrified of. Because you remember, they offered Jen and them $10 million to set up a labor institute if they would stop organizing. Right? Yeah, I don't know, they, they, they turned it down so they go nowhere. But, you know, the, the Bureau of Labor, you know, came to them and said, look, we will pay you to study the problems of black workers, but since you get government money, of course you can't do political activity. Come on. Come on, you know, it's like the Ford Foundation offers that money when we have Northwestern to start black studies. We'll give you $5 million if you do it this way. He said, that's okay, we'll do it our way and we're not doing that. Right? I would say, it, it, it's, it's black people that have the class consciousness. Right? You know, that's the problem in the country. It's not, it, if white people had the class consciousness that black people would have, you'd have a working class consciousness. Yes. Right? African Americans will join any union that will let them in. We've got a high percentage of unionized population of any group in the country. We've never hesitated to organize as working people. You know, whether it's a slave revolt all the way down, and it's, it's the lack of class consciousness in the general white population that has retarded socialism in this country. Not because black people are backwards. You know, it's that they just don't wait. They said, we can't wait for black people to get their heads together before we move. Right? And in short, you get the, the perfect kind of configuration of those things. You know, when you get in fact a working class, they can support independent black politics. That's why you couldn't shut them down. That's why you have Clegg here, that's why you have Motown here. You know, that's why you can do stuff that's way to the left of most countries because you have an economic base where they can't rock you. Right? That's why Detroit looks like it looks today. They said, no, 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 you will never get this kind of power again. Right? So they're literally dismantling the city. And they're going to build it up again, but not like it is before. Because the way it was before is too much power in black people's hands. You know, just like they're doing in D.C. now. You know, you're breaking up power blockers. And you say, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to split this stuff up. You're getting no more black mayors. We're going to get you a, uh, Now you got the transitional kind of technocrat mayors, like you get like a, a Cory Booker or Michael Nutt in Philly or the guy they had in D.C. And these are basically kind of, you know, Obama is president. Th this is that generation of technocrats. Right? They don't really have any loyalty to anybody other than the class that put them in power. They wouldn't have black people to put them in power. They're coming in there with white money and they're coming in as millionaires. Right? And they're a transitional group to see how this thing is going to shake itself out. And we should not get confused by that. You know, because the key to the thing is the power on the bottom. So young people moving today, if they continue to move, so it's going to reshift that dynamic from this kind of corporate everything that's going to line up thing. You know, but you're not likely to get that configuration in terms of the economy again, because industry has been so dispersed worldwide. You know, that the major strikes are going to be in, in, in China, they're going to be in Nigeria, they're going to be in Brazil, they're going to be in South Africa, where industrialization is taking hold in a mass, mass kind of way. Well, <clears throat> the struggle, you know, is, is a two-line struggle development. And so I think we need to look at North, what's happening in North with Ras Barat, and also what happened in Jackson, Mississippi, you know. And that took 27 years for us, you know. I mean, they were down there, for, you know, with Chuck Wade. 27 years, so it looked like automatically Chuck Wade became mayor. Uh, he didn't, you know, so uh, he was almost debarred, you know, um, fighting cases in Mississippi. I mean, he, you know, really fused in with the civil right, with the move, you know, and you have a lot of snake people down you know, who are still there everywhere, and yeah, still there. 
And so, uh, you know, I was at one reunion, and you know, he, you know, got the, the endorsement, you know, uh, first the city council, and then when he went to run for mayor, you know. So I've seen Chuck Way come out of two churches, you know. I mean, you know, they, you know, I mean, you know, I say, man, you know, he, and he said, wait a minute. He's talking to church people, you know. <laughs> you know, so yeah. he had, that was his base now, yeah. you know. So and so uh, that's 27 years. Yeah. Yeah. So they would, you know, the J.K. plan uh, had an economic uh, <clears throat> basis of co-ops and um, urban gardens. And uh, the they were uh, start when he became councilman. He started holding these meetings, and it evolved into uh, a people's assembly. And if you know, I mean, it's online. You go there. I mean, it's like showing up, folks. You know, I mean, this ain't no political. You know, political folks. You know, I mean. The, you know, traditional political folks. This is the folks, you know. So it's a mass, you know, they had done some mass organizing. <coughs> now, we see the Black Lives Matter is very important that it's raising, is putting the question of racial oppression back on the political agenda, you know, back into the, you know, Raising some consciousness as spontaneous as any movement. It has all kinds of contradictions, but it has it is mobilizing a section of young people. You know, but where does it go from here? Where do we go from here? And we feel. You know, in Philly, I can just, you know, speak for some folks that, you know, um, some uh, old activists and young activists, and, uh, <clears throat> including Yusuf. You know, we've been discussing, you know, uh, building a base. Now, your industrial base is gone. All right. The industrial base is going. James saw that in 1963. I used to lay on the floor at 3061, trying to grasp what he was saying. But I mean, he he was tough talking about 30 years that he was witnessing this automation in cybernation process. You know, we it didn't hit really hit us until about the 80s, you know, I mean, like, hey, this is it, you know. So where do you go from here? But now, wherever I go, I ask, you know, like, is everybody on the board? No, everybody's Do you, are there jobs around? I ask, you know, if, if you're poor, is there construction being going on in your city? People say, yes, yeah, construction all the time. I say, well, who's doing the construction? <laughs> you know, yeah. and it is, you go all the way back to the boys. And then the Philadelphia Negro, they say, you know, black man can't get any, you know, I mean, like stable employment. Because the immigrants had come in and they sealed all that off with the unions. Now, it's union. Now, they, they'll bring in, you know, people from Peru and anywhere. Who are not unionized and they do the dirty work. But that keeps you out because you 
you're going to demand unionization. Right. And so <clears throat> somehow, you know, uh, within this base building, with young people, as we politicized, you know, I mean, if you go on, you know, I mean, they, why are the police, you know, attacking us? Attacking young folks, because you expend them. Alright? You, you're the functional illiterate, or you, you know, I mean, you, you know, they, you're not working, and it's structured for you not to be working. So before you can walk across the street, yeah, hey, man, hey, I'm getting a better. Yeah. Now you gonna have to fight. Young people are gonna have African Americans gonna have to say, hey man, you know, it, 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 you got these jobs at our expense, and it's gonna be rough now. Those unions are racist and they play Democratic and vote Republican. All right. you know. Yes. You know, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, but you, so what you do is, you, you know, you have churches, you have, you know, you set up and you have, <coughs> um, Journeyman all around. You set up training or apprenticeship programs. But research needs to be done on if they, your apprenticeships are accepted by a union, what's the membership of the union? And what's the rate, right, that they're going to open up to give you justice? And so that, you know, you know, if you talk about reparations, you got to open up. You know, I mean, they, oh, there ain't going to be no America. I mean, you know, I mean, what, <laughs> you know, you committing genocide against us. Yeah. Let me give, let me give you an example from that. You know, at, at UMass, you know, at M, you know, you know, Massachusetts in the state, they built this the biggest construction project, the Big Dig, right? Took them 15 years to build this big highway thing, and you know, some billions of dollars that big cost them about. They have 40,000 workers. Where did these 40,000 workers come from? Ireland. Ireland. Right. What happened when they finished the Big Dig? Right? They didn't go home. They now said, okay, because on our university board of trustees, by state law, there's a member of the, of the, the Labor Trade Council of the state. Right? So when you vote university money, there's a labor guy there from the building trades that says, well, y'all got, how about some buildings? So they now turn to building up buildings on every campus in the state. Our campus has built $300 million worth of buildings in the past eight years. Right? Every class I teach, I have a student say, take your little cell phone, you take, find me a picture of a black worker. Find me a picture of a black worker, I'll give you an A in this class. <laughs> find me a picture of a black worker. And I'm not talking about pushing the wheel, but I'm talking about a worker worker, you know, skilled labor, right? The best I got is a brother with a wheelbarrow, hard carrier, mm -hmm. right? And exactly what I said, when they did our bill, they renovated a new Africa house with white labor. Right? The one day I show up at work, I see some brown people, Puerto Rican brothers. You know what they'd ask for? Asbestos removal. Mm -hmm. They got their hazmat suits on, the building, I can't go in the building because they got it all shrink wrapped and stuff. This is the deadly life killing kind of stuff. They bring in these little brown brothers. I'm saying this is the first time I see some brown people up in here and they're doing stuff that will kill you. Right? I can't come in the building for a week till they suck all this crap out of the air, right? Then the white guys come back after the building's clean and they get the skilled labor job. They build the elevators, they do, they do the masonry, they do the windows, they do 
Every single building on our campus is built with that labor. Every single contracting company is an Irish contracting company, and those workers are still on work permits from Ireland. Ireland has the largest immigration quota of any country, you know, any country in this in the world. Right, small as it is, they get ten thousand work permits, permanent visas every year. This is Kennedy's empire. That's why people love Teddy Kennedy. He looked after his people. I Man, I don't knock him that. He looked after other people, but his first his base, his base was his people. You know, and so anything that moved, they were in there first with those kind of jobs. They're not thinking about letting no black people get those jobs. You know, and the reason the police are like they are and the way the fire department is like they are is because it's the exact same thing in our state too. You cannot find me 10 black policemen outside of Boston, anywhere in the state. You cannot find, there are only five black electricians in the whole state who are certified to be in the electrical union in the whole state. Whole state. Right? Until you crack that, and that's, that's why the Democratic Party always ends up getting this clock cleaned. Right? Because they won't deal with race. If they had a principal position on race, and would deal with the fact that they're union-based in a lot of cases when it's not, you know, uh, service unions or black people, you know, women, right? Their traditional white labor base is conservative white men, right? And they hold on to them dearly. Obama didn't never want a primary in our state. Liberal mass too, he never won a primary. Clinton, you know, Hillary Clinton beat him in our state in the primaries, right? And the head of the labor council, who was a friend of mine, a white guy named Haynes, went around, he came to me and said, look, you always give me crap about racism. I want to tell you, you're right. I have to go around. He went around to all the unions in our, in our state when Obama ran and said, I'm not going down behind this crap. He said, you, we are Democrat. We vote for the Democrat. I don't care what it looks like. You vote for the Democrat. He said, John, I never heard people call niggas so much as niggas. I walk into a union hall every state, and they said, he may be a Democrat, but he's a nigga. See, look, I ain't going down like that. So I ain't going down. He said, my grandparents brought me over here from Ireland, and we support the working class, and we support the Democratic Party. He's the head of the Democratic Party. You better vote for it. Right? Obama barely got over 50% of the white vote in our state. Right? The white working class did not support him. Now, other parts of the country, they did, but still not the overwhelming majority. This is a white guy who was Irish, who dearly loves his people, and he came back and apologized. He said, I thought you were making up stuff, but I'm walking into a room of all white, my people, and all I hear is nigga this, nigga that. You know, we don't want no poon in the White House, da, 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 da. And he said, he nutted up. I mean, he cussed them all out. I mean, he went from, from town to town to town, trying to get consciousness into the white working class. That's, that's what we have to deal with, you know. And uh, unless you get something on the white side, bringing that up, honestly, hard-headed, straightforward, then, then you're not going you know, you're not gonna have any kind of thing that will take on this country. Because the ruling class will play that, you know, good school, nice suburban thing, safe neighborhood, da-da-da-da-da, which means white. You know, a good neighborhood is a white neighborhood, a good school is a white school. Right? A safe neighborhood is white, is a white neighborhood. Everybody knows what those words mean. And that's true everywhere in the whole country. And until you confront that at the top, you know, if there's going to be a left, then you're not going to have any kind of problem. And you can't duck it behind about identity politics. You know, a lot of people organize it. Well, if you, if you oppress me as a black person, I'm going to organize as a black person. If you oppress women because they're women, they should organize as women to fight that. And that's not identity politics, that's common sense. Right? Until you get that honest discussion, there will be no social movement in this country that will transform this country. We know, we'll do the best we can, but until you get that, that, that understanding that this thing is connected, really connected, not just on paper. Everybody says it on paper, race, class, gender, race, class, gender, as if magically this thing is going to throw itself together. This is work. This is work you got to do. You know, and we can lead it, we can push it, we can fight as hard as we can, but unless there's allies who are really allies, then you're not, we're going to be spinning wheels again. You know, and I mean, that's where we are now. It's getting pretty bad. You know, I mean, it really is getting pretty bad. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um.